you weave your way through the woods and come across a giant fog that is hiding a party of monsters from your team. When you look at them, you realize the face of these monsters resembles something very familiar. It's a kahu. I was going to say it's my face, bro. That's oh, the worst thing I just no, Oh, my God. Close. I thought that was my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> the monster is not Kahu. She is still the if it's an angel of the week that we've had in here. And I am still there, guys. NJ, thank you for joining us for this 11 a.m. session of Get Into Games Aotearoa 2022. And, of course, we are talking about Dungeons and & Dragons. And, yes, somebody in the chat said it, Warhammer 40K. I'm looking forward to touching on to this world of text-based role-playing games and so much more now kahu did want me to point out that yes you guys may know it from stranger things but we do have to point out uh why are you watching stranger things i'm pretty sure it's r13 if you're not of age please don't watch that scary show even though i found a season four is it season four now season three so. whatever the recent season is i didn't find a scary stranger things four it was season scary. four so yes um but this morning for this session of dungeons and dragons and warhammer we are joined by the incredible, well, I'm going to assume that they are masters in their game if they are running games. If not, they are party members. We are joined by Matt and Jake. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Great, thank you. Now, yeah. I do believe uh, that we have the audio working in our production. Uh, we're on the case, uh, starting to get that sorted. Just going to bring us some chat etiquette again. Please, guys, don't spam the chat. We do have mods. It's not great. We want to share uh, great answers and great insights with all of you because we do have amazing guests taking the time out of their day to share this with you. I was very excited to see one of you in the chat saying uh, that you guys are wanting to do your own Dungeons & Dragons in school. Um, so let's, let's start with Matt. Uh, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> um, I am the even more effervescent Matt. Oh! Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a, I run Dungeons and Dragons here in Rotorua. Um, mm. uh, as much as I use it as a, as a game just for me and my friends, I also run the community mm -hmm. here in Rotorua. Um, but I also use it in, um, as a therapy tool for Rangatahi. Um, can, can you please explain exactly what Dungeons and Dragons is? Um, so Dungeons and Dragons is pretty much the, I'd say it's the grandfather of gaming. So when, when there wasn't video gaming, people were sitting, th throwing dice and just using their imagination. So it's, it's pretty much the basics of it is it's a, um, collaborative storytelling game where, um, you've got your dungeon master and your player, um, dungeon master looks after, they create the world, they're everybody and everyone. And like, say, if you walk into a city, the dungeon master is all, say, the animals that are in the city. They're all the people that inhabit the city. They're the sky. They're the ground. They're everything that's that you're going to interact with. Um, players, they look after pretty much their character, their character's backstories, um, their motivations for becoming an adventurer. Um, normally, it's a tragic backstory. That's your um, that's your basic <laughs> for a um, for a player. Um, but yeah, basically, if you've seen Stranger Things or um, Big Bang Theory, uh, there's a lot of uh, celebrities and whatnot playing at the moment. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I've watched my um, a video on YouTube that I really liked because apparently guys has been running one game of Dungeons and Dragons for like almost 20 years. Um, and I, I find that so incredible that it's just the same campaign, but he's continued it over this long amount of time, um, which, you know, for me to fathom that amount of information that he has to process in terms of um, where the story is going, I, I find quite incredible. Um, now, as yourself, Jake, you do is Warhammer, is it? Can you run us through that? Uh, yes, yep, sure. Um, so I'm the president of uh, Wargaming Rotorua. It's a club here in town. Um, and basically, Warhammer is a miniature uh, war game played on the tabletop. So uh, if you ever see like little army men, um, it's essentially like an expensive version of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's not something you can pick up at your $2 shop, but um, you get to build the models, you paint them. Um, we actually have painting sessions and building sessions at the club and Amazing. we teach you how to play the game where you're actually just playing everything out on a tabletop picture mm -hmm. old style war movies where they got those like pushy little sticks and they're moving all of the tanks and things it's essentially like that for geeks <laughs> i know i know the way you're talking about that's incredible so these actually sound quite social yes yeah very um and, and you have clubs which is cool um how can people at home find their local clubs 
Um, so most of the wargaming style clubs are on Facebook. Um, some people also share on Instagram as well. Um, we've just created an Instagram page, but we've been on Facebook for many years. Um, and it's just trying to get our names out there, really. It's, it can be quite difficult to find if you don't have a hobby store in town that sells that kind of thing. But if you do have a hobby store, head to them. They'll know the local scene. Uh, Someone in chat says that Warhammer is very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, it is pretty expensive. <laughs> um, now, I'm really interested with the whole 20 years campaign thing. Can you, gentlemen, please each tell us how long does a game usually go on for? Uh, yeah, well, it depends really, but majority of my games, each session is about four hours. Uh, I managed to trick a group of my ex-workmates into, and um, we all worked, we all had a free day on Friday, so I just mm. said to them one night, oh, what's everybody doing tomorrow? Um, do you guys want to come around and play D&D &D, uh, four years later? <laughs> yeah. still, in the, still in the same campaign yet to finish. Yeah. Um, really? So yeah, it's been great. It's, oh, it's, wow. really, it's a really good way to knit together a group of friends and mm. actually have a good social group that doesn't require, say, like alcohol yeah. and partying and that sort of stuff. Mm. We just sit at home and throw some dice and eat way too much snacks. We spend about yeah. the first hour just eating and catching up. So it's it's really social, yeah. um, especially for us. Um, or I like to call it an anti-social social group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a D&D &D group that's been going for four years as well. We're just about to finish our campaign, like two sessions away. But yes, we have quite a large pizza budget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is really cool. It's like, for me, it, it sounds almost like, you know, watching your favorite TV series, but you're making it. Yeah, you know, like I can imagine doing that, and I'm like, I can't wait till next session, you know, where we find out what's going to happen. It's that's cool. Yeah, sounds like it, it drives itself a lot. Now, with the kids in chat, if you guys have any questions, do drop them in the chat. Of course, we have uh, these gentlemen here to share their knowledge and their background in this particular form of game. And now, of course, with this world of gaming, you know, especially with how Dungeons and Dragons uh, paved the way for text-based games and RPGs, um, I really like how it kind of funnels creativity out of people and um, with that in mind have you guys ever run into any experiences with players where they've potentially reached like a block uh because they, they, they're unsure of what to do uh with the next step in the game oh yeah with D, &D that happens quite often but um, yeah. uh, it's quite helpful for your um dm to help kind of guide them yeah. um to making some decisions uh sometimes it can be because they're overly cautious about there's a gate there and its own sole purpose is just it opens by itself, but they want to spend about an hour testing to make sure it's not some sort of magical trap that's been set there by some nefarious evil person. <laughs> I had to shift a group of players and like, okay, so this fog starts rolling in and you can feel its presence, blah, blah, blah. They're like, oh my gosh, we can't just, we can't just step through. And I'm like, hang on, we'll throw a rock through. It's like, yep, the rock hits the ground, it skips past. So like, can I cast um, detect magic? It's like, yep, you get a faint magic aura. They kind of, you kind of get that, it just opens the gate. Like, oh, no, I don't trust it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've experienced that as well. Like, um, people's own mental blocks can uh, trigger. If you've invested so much time into building your own character, you're basically playing yourself in this, like, miniature world. Um, and if you're hesitant personally to, like, try and jump past a pit trap, um, so is your character, right? And it's all also dependent on how well you roll that dice um, and whether or not you fall in. So sometimes it's just the uh, dungeon master, he encourages you to go, okay, look, it, it's not going to be too difficult. Um, this might happen if you just stay here, so let's try to keep rolling forward. Um, I have to say, like, I really, like, admire you guys. So I do um, a little bit of acting here and there. And, you know, I have it easy because I've got a script. Yeah. But for you guys, you have to be able to, like, step into this character, but then make it up at the same time. And that's actually really difficult. But I imagine you kind of get used to it. And if you've got a good group of friends and, like, a comfortable space, um, then you can really just let yourself free creatively, right? Yeah, hard, hardest part with D&D, &D especially with that is, um, say, your players are in the town and they say, oh, can I... Um... Can I just talk to one of the um, the people walking past us and some questions? Oh, it's sweet. You find this person, they look like this. They're like, oh, um, what's your name? <laughs> your, <laughs> name your name is Brana. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, so what, what do you do here in town? Like, I am a blacksmith. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. But then there's also um, like different DMing styles. Like mine's more. I'm a, I'm a on the fly DM. I like doing the like different voices. I'm not as much into like the full planning of knowing everything that's going to happen. I just like let things run on the fly. But mm. there, there are pitfalls for that. Yeah, yeah. You never want to plan too much and then have your um, party go left instead of right. And it's like, okay, I'm just going to throw out four pages of work. <laughs> uh, just what was on the right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I believe we can actually talk about some safe channels. Um, ones I, I personally watch on um, YouTube and that I think many people uh, would follow uh, the likes of uh, Critical Role and maybe Dimension 20. Dimension 20 are, are a bit more adult orientated, but I really enjoy the Dungeon Master Brennan's work uh, that they do on that. Um, with that in mind for both of you, Matt and Jake, um, have, have you got a story of a moment where a player just threw something at you that you weren't able to manage or, or you were just so shocked by the, the move that they made that it just kind of ruined, um, like Jake was saying, those four pages of work that you had had, um, starting with you there, Matt. Uh, last week, I actually had to leave the room to compose myself because I was in, I was in tears <laughs> yeah. laughing. So uh, my, my players were inside a cavern. They'd rescued some gnomes and some dwarves from, uh, they were like slave miners. They'd rescue them, got to this one point. They'd, they were on a rest, so they were like in a cave on a cliff face. Mm. Um, so I was explaining to them, it's like, oh, as you're on watch, you can see that they're, um, as, you're, as you're looking on the cliff side, there seems to be like um, uh, like bits of old, say, uh, leftover carcass that seems to have dropped from somewhere high up. Um, there you can, kind of like as a, if a bird has been nesting somewhere and there's like feces mm. kind of down the side of the cliff. Um, so one of my players was like, oh man, I want to figure out what the feces are so I can figure out what type of animal this is. So like, can I pick up one of the gnomes? I'm like, okay, the sleeping gnomes. She's like, yeah, yeah. The nestled gnomes that are all together. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, make a stealth check. So she rolls really high. She manages to pick up one of these gnomes that are sleeping. I was like, okay, so what do you do with it? She's like, I'm going to put it outside the, the cliff and like just dip it in the feces. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Oh, because I don't want to touch it myself. <laughs> um, so she does this and because in my mind, I know that there's this gigantic monstrous creature at the top of the cliff that hunts off this cliff yeah. and it has a nest up there. So I'm like, okay, so um, roll to make a strength save. She's like, oh. Oh, that's weird. So she rolls, the creature beats it. So this three-headed no chimera drops off the cliff. So she's holding this gnome out off the cliff, snatches it, and then flies off. So she says, <laughs> oh, um, I'm just going to walk back in the cave and act like nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone else is asleep, so nobody knows anything's happening. There's now one gnome less. So she wakes up the next person who's on watch. She says, oh, um, one of the gnomes woke up and like sleepwalked off the cliff so <laughs> yeah no. so yeah that we had to we had to stop the game for a bit so we could all stop laughing <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh Laughing from everybody's faces it was yeah that is no build up there jake but I'm <laughs> something <to> just <laughs> yeah uh might not be as good, but um, there was a session where I was a player and um, we encountered this room that was full of fog and we were like, do we want to go in there? Are we sure? Um, there's it going to be anything in there? Because like, a lot of our characters can see in the dark, but when you uh, encounter fog in Dungeons and & Dragons, it's like, ah, I have no ability to see through that. It's just basically walking around in the dark. So one of our characters, um, our players, was like, yeah, I'll go in. Let's see what it is. They went in and they had to make this check which they failed and then instantly their intelligence reduced to zero so basically everyone has a stat and a default person is a, um, a stat of 10 out of 20 so a normal person has the intelligence of 10 they went down to one and then came out of the cave and were just like randomly running around they went halfway up the stairs and then jumped off the stairs to see how far they could go and they were just doing all these random things and she was a race that's a shifter so it can kind of climb up walls when they shift and just just ah, oh, it was just trying to wrangle this like cat person. <laughs> it was so infuriating because we're trying to get on with the quest. There's yeah. no magic that we have that can heal them. <laughs> And yeah, it's like stairs. It's like yes, they're stairs. It's like how far do they go? It's like I don't know. We're about to find that out. Did <laughs> just you just off the cliff? Like, <laughs> oh, I wish we could have done that. But... <laughs> yeah, that that oh, that gnome story is something else. <laughs> <laughs>
crushed. You're running into a cat person who who is obviously running away from from your party, um, and just delaying the game, actually moving forward would be very frustrating, yeah. uh, to say the least. And now, of course, you know that means there's also a lot of strategy and a lot of creativity in mind for these types of games. Um, with that, do, do players have to have a good background in that? Um, or, or do you guys also guide them with that, starting with you, Matt? Um, I've, I've pretty much, uh, hopefully my players don't see this, but I've pretty mm. much been babysitting them this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Half of them don't know what the heck they're doing, what they can mm. do on their parents, but it's it's more a social gathering for me. Mm. Like, I'm not too too bothered about the rules and that sort of stuff. It's more that everybody's just in there having fun. But yeah, mm. it's, it's pretty easy to pick up. Um, later on, when you get that sort of group that, that are really rules heavy and really like um, story story driven, mm. um, I've had players turn up and they're like, oh, so I wrote this backstory and it's like pages and pages and pages mm. long. Like, oh yeah, cool. And then you get to another player and they're like, oh, this is my character. Like, oh, any backstory there? Like, um, I don't know, the parents died. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, cool. cool. <laughs> Run with it. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's pretty easy to yeah just help the help the newer players along and not have too much um, expectation. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, had some friends who have been like, "I'm not creative at all. If you put me in front of a keyboard or a blank piece of paper, I can't create." And it's like, well, that isn't a creative environment. Just join the game, and let's say we're walking through this village, and you you see this old lady drop her uh, bag of fruit, like, what do you do? And then most people will be like, oh, I'll go over and help her pick it up. And then they can start a conversation. Mm -hmm. And if you're explaining that there's a bard at the town fountain, like playing a song on his lute, they can actually kind of picture that and in, in their minds. And then they can go, oh, well, my guy has like a pan flute. So I'm gonna go over and start rocking out with this bard that I don't know and earn some money. Um, it's more of the the environment itself creates creativity. Um, I don't find that it's something that you have to be good at in the uh, beginning, because you'll just pick it up and you'll enjoy having that social interaction with everyone. Yeah. Um, there is a question in chat um, about Dungeons and Dragons. What's the cost of getting involved? Nothing. Nothing. It's no cost for using kind of group. Yeah. Um, most face-to-face -face games, pencil and paper, but normally a DM will at least supply those. Yeah. Um, you can get dice if you want to, but there's app, apps for that. You can even go to Google and find there's a there's a dice roller in there. Um, mm. yeah, no no cost at all really. Just bring snacks. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Some, someone's response to the um old lady with the fruit is steal the fruit and get rid of the witnesses. <laughs> yeah. See. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a rogue. <laughs> I've just jumped onto Google because I wanted to check that, Matt. And you're right, there's definitely... Oh, and there it's is a 20 D20. Dice. Yeah. yeah. So that's what you use for Dungeons. So, yeah. yeah, for those in the chat, um, if you don't know about Dungeons and & Dragons and the die that you use for that, uh, you will actually use a 20 side dice. Mm -hmm. um, and to roll a natural 20 is, like, the best thing uh, that you can do within the Pretty world cool. of Dungeons, yeah. and, um, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and now, of course, we spoke earlier when I, I did my intro and Kahu called herself a monster. Um, <laughs> Kahu. <laughs> Kahu. Kahu the monster. Uh, Kahu is the monster. Um, there, there has been this emergence um, of, you know, Dungeons and Dragons within the pop culture itself. Um, because of that, have both of you seen more people want to join sessions or just more interest around the world of Dungeons and Dragons? in Warhammer? Um, I've definitely seen uh, more people wanting to join. Like, mm. um, I think I tried to start about three years ago here in Rotorua because I play in Tauranga and there was no one who was playing that was easy to contact. Yeah. So um, I got just a group of friends and convinced them to start playing. And now I probably encounter three people every month uh, asking is there a DD &D right. session going on it's like i'm currently in two i can't do another oh, wow. one but, um yeah. yeah and now uh, this saturday our normal dm uh, isn't uh, like ready to carry on his story so mm. somebody else is going to jump in as a dm and yeah. just do like this and um, we call them one shots where it's just a story that you just play through in the day yeah. Um, it's not an ongoing campaign. It's just a bit of random fun. It, and it's... Is there a story that we can play in 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. I, don't know, I, I actually want to play now, though. Like... 
Uh, not from me. <laughs> um, Pass over to the maestro. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I've got my dice. Uh, if you were, say, uh, one of the Avengers, who would you be? Oh, I feel like I'd be the woman one. Uh, Black Widow? Sure. Black Widow. <laughs> <laughs> Spider, maybe a ranger. Um, yeah, no, I'd say probably Black Widow. Yeah. Yeah. Just showing quickly to the camera that there is a die here. And now I do think uh, Matt is trying to strategize a quick game uh, because we do have uh, these die that um, thankfully production brought in for us to have a look at. These are the D20s. Um, I'm going to do an intelligence check to see how good my next question will be. 14! <laughs> That's far too much effort for me right now. But <laughs> well, with that in mind, I, so uh, if, if Kahu had chosen herself to be Black Widow in the small D&D game um, that we would be playing, um, what would be your next step as Dungeon Master um, their map into moving their story forward? Um, yeah, well, I suppose it's just creating the creating mm -hmm. the area. Uh, but yeah, yeah. the D&D is super flexible. Uh, which you can pretty much turn anything into a quick game or a, or a mm. story. Like um, I'm actually building a um, Puraco module at the moment to um, tell um, to tell local stories yeah. in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I've been running it with different um, uh, at one of the schools, uh, Te Kura Kopapa or Te Kotu, and we ran a ran a game there, which was daunting for me because all of those kids are freaking fluent in like three different languages. And wow. <laughs> I'm yeah. still learning the basics of Te Reo, and these kids mm. can speak three languages. And I've now written a module that has bits and pieces of Te Reo in it. Oh. So while I'm doing it, I'm like, hang on, stop, I'm going to stop for a second. Did that make sense? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Can you explain how the dice work? Like, what what did that mean when you? Rolled. Oh, and Metal Jake, if one of you could take it. Well, gravity, really. Yeah. Oh, well, uh... Yeah, you kind of just roll them and then the surface <laughs> does <doesn't> work. <laughs> yeah. Wow. No, but like the 1 to 20, like what? Yeah, so um, different different versions of the game have used the, the numbers and different different things, but the higher you roll, the better it is, really. Yeah. Um, there, mm -hmm. might, there might be a part, say, okay, so you're, uh, you're Black Widow, or um, maybe in a D&D universe, you're like a ranger, so um, mm -hmm. somebody who, who's proficient with ranged weapons, but can also fight hand-to-hand. Um, -hand. Um, maybe you've been chasing a bandit or something, and they've run through the woods. Um, you've, been, you've been following them, so I'll get you to make a survival check to... Um, to track them. This is my role. Yep. Nineteen. Oh, okay. Oh, so in my head, I'll get a what's called a DC, a DC <laughs> rating or a challenge rating for something. So, um, with a nineteen plus whatever your um your modifiers would be, being a being a ranger, you'll be quite high in your survival. Um, so I'd say um as you're as you're walking through the forest, you um easily um see the footprints um through the mud. Uh, there's been uh it's been raining in the last few days, so the the imprints of of this person's feet are quite quite easy to see um as you're walking through and following these footprints you see that some of the branches have actually snapped and um, as you check one of the branches you can kind of tell that it's it's recent as um say some of the sap is still um still coming from this branch mm. so you can kind of tell exactly how far away they are and how how long it's been um so you pick up your pace and you begin to follow this track um as you're following the track you see it comes to a um a riverbed um it's about uh, we use feet in this game because yeah um it's about <laughs> it's about 30 feet wide um yep. what do you do um, first of all, I would be suspicious of the footprints because if I'm following somebody, they're obviously somebody of great interest. So, you know, they're not just some thief, right? Like this is somebody who knows what they're doing. So I would be suspicious of the footprints, first of all, and just make sure that they are genuine. Um, with the river, I assume that it's um, gone up a bit because it's been raining. So perhaps I'd look for um, another way around. Nice. Uh, make another survival check uh, with the advantage. So roll twice, take the highest number. 14. 7. 14. Um, so with this, with this knowledge, as you're looking at these tracks, um, you can see that they, um, the person has tried to backpedal on the tracks, um, making a, f uh, a fake path for you to follow. Um, as you're watch looking at them, you can see that the, the actual tracks seem to have been slightly brushed off and they've tried to hide their tracks. Um, so as you're, as you're looking up, you notice to your left that just behind like a large rock, you can just, you just see the movement of a figure um, about 20 feet out from you. 
Look at that. Wow. <laughs> Just like that. Well, I um, missed it. Um, and the next episode of. Yeah. Yeah. said in the chat, why, uh, why they say you need a die. Uh, so if you were uh, just watching that segment, a die is used for checking stats against a character. The dungeon master will ask you to roll it to check against modifiers and how they can move the story forward with the character's um, own stats in mind. Uh, so with that case, they used Kahoo's as a ranger, uh, meant they had high survival skill, and she got a good roll of the die, which increased her ability to actually investigate the scene and see what the outcome of that was. And that was really great DMing there um, from that one of our guests. And of course, Jake, um, you've pointed us to Facebook, but where else could these rangatahi look for you um, in regards to the world of 40, 40k and its expensive habit <laughs> <laughs> um well here in uh Rotorua, we're based at the digital um base camp just next oh, door oh nice just next yeah. door yes yeah awesome. we're upstairs and we meet mm -hmm. every second and fourth sunday and we also do a monday evening uh, which is the first and third monday of the month so basically mm -hmm. we can't really advertise we meet every fortnight because mm -hmm. who knows when you started right yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> just look at your calendar and count how many mondays there are and yeah. um, if it's the first or third we'll be there from 7 p.m um, and on a Sunday, we'll be there from 10 p.m. Otherwise, you can jump on places like YouTube um, and Twitter as well, uh, Twitch. Uh, they have um, just live games that are being played. You can watch um, recorded games. Basically, there is a big market now um, mm. for content creators creating um, just content around mm. the game, how to play the game. So you don't have to come in not knowing anything. You can come in um, having studied a bit. But if you want to just learn everything, uh, we're happy to teach you. Um, Warhammer 40,000 is actually the world's largest science fiction game when it comes oh. to the amount of content of books mm. that is written. Mm. There's more um, like fiction books written about it than there is yeah. in Star Wars or Star Trek. Wow. And I know Henry Cavill likes it too. So yes, yeah, apparently yeah. he's been playing since he was eleven. So yeah. I don't know how big his armies must oh be. Oh my gosh, he's not short on money. <laughs> no, he's not. Um, and same question goes for you, Matt. Um, where can El Rangatahi find more of your work, or how to get into that world of Dungeons and Dragons? Uh, well, yeah, I, I run the Facebook group here for Rotorua, so I think we Rotorua Dungeons and Dragons, but there's also um, Dungeons and Dragons Aotearoa mm -hmm. um, for everybody across New Zealand. Um, I'll be starting up kids' games again, hopefully, once I find some more Dungeon Masters. Um, we were running them weekly at the library, so we had about 15, 15 20 kids. Uh, wow. Um, we ran a few games here, um, so yeah. I think we'll start back, right, Marcus? Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> right, Marcus? He can't say no now. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> there was a thumbs up behind the computer, yeah. so. Yeah, so there's all, all the Facebook groups, um, so yeah, make sure you join. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah well, D &D, so yeah. Yeah, definitely, because we have some of the uh, younger players in the Warhammer Club who are interested mm. in learning D and D, and um, one of their parents actually plays as well, which is mm. great. And oh. he's um, been like, "I kind of want to run a D and D mm. session because he used to play when he was a kid, mm. um, like eighties style D and D. That would be cool." <laughs> yeah. Um, and he just wants to find uh, more kids and have a safe environment in which to mm. play. So awesome. we're actually trying to set up the base camp to allow for DD &D as well because yeah, we were actually playing here for a bit. yeah amazing uh, well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us this morning. That was a fantastic session on Dungeons & Dragons and Warhammer. Uh, we can tell Kahu uh, very much wants to jump into it themselves. Um, <laughs> as for that, we are moving on to, I believe, our final Empower video for this week. Uh, let's have one more look at what happened down on the West Coast with all that amazing technology.
Technology. Thanks to the likes of Play Tech, Hado, Victory Up, and Nati Gaming. Um, are we still jealous of it, Kahu? I'm still very jealous. Oh, of I'm still and, very, very jealous. You know, they had like switches, VR. Libraries are the place to be right now because uh, you got the Dungeons and Dragons, you got the Warhammer, you've got all I have these a, gaming. Practically computers. a library in my house. I have so many books. And <laughs> I have the whole Demon Slayer manga collection for no reason, just because I can. You know, so, um, but that was our second slot of the day, the second to last session. Um, how are you feeling? Yeah. I've I don't know. I feel the sad that it's over. Yeah, but um, no, that was uh, a, again a thank you to our guests Matt and Jake for all their background on Dungeons and Dragons and Warhammer 40k. Uh, if you want to check that out, we should have links up at GetIntoGames.nz, and of course you can also search on Facebook or YouTube. As for ourselves, we will be heading into slot three, which will be the future of technology, and we will be joined by our friends and sponsors at Code Avengers to run us through that. Um, very much looking forward to seeing what their final session looks like. I've still been that guy, ZNJ, joined by Hahu, Tetsu, the, 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 the monster, the monster in the fog, Hahu. So we will see you guys back here at 12 p.m. for the final session of Get Into Games Aotearoa 2022. Kakite.